Uh, hi everyone, I'm so excited uh, that you're here with us uh, on this Andoa video series. This is a series that is really trying to uh, help couples, you know, with very practical uh, lessons on what to do, what to do uh, when we are facing challenges. Uh, so today I'm so excited. I do have a couple friend with me. I have Anthony Jaroge and uh, Miriam Jaroge. Uh, Anthony is an executive pastor at uh, Mavuno Church, and I'm so thankful uh, that the Njerogas can be here with us. So karibuni sana. And um, I think with you, this, uh, yes, as I mentioned in this video series, we are asking how. How have couples overcome their challenges? How have couples overcome their differences? And as, as previously mentioned in the, in the other videos, is that we normally come into marriage uh, with flawed foundations. We come, so to speak, with our baggage uh, from our families of origin. And when we fail to recognize that we have come with baggage, then we end up blaming, you know, uh, each other and end up having such, you know, amazing fights, not understanding, hey, you know, I need to look and to understand my own baggage. And so I'm really thankful that uh, the Njerogas are, are here with us. Uh, we want to learn from them we want to hear how they have overcome their challenges, how they have overcome their differences. Uh, as I had been talking to the Njerogas earlier, they told me they've been married for 12 years. 12 years, you know, those are good years to have, you know, gone through quite a lot of, you know, quite a little bit of experience. And, um, and so I'd like us to get to know them a little bit more. And I'm going to start uh, with you, Miriam. And I'm going to ask the question, you know, just tell us, you know, uh, Miriam, who is Miriam, uh, you know, how did you grow up? How many, you know, just tell us a little bit more about your family background. Okay, yeah, uh, so I'm uh, Miriam. Uh, we married years, blessed. And uh, so I grew up in a family uh, that was really close knit. Uh, and uh, we were five girls. Uh, uh, one of my sister passed on in 2004, but yes, we grew up uh, five girls and both uh, my parents were very, uh, um, at, at, like, they were there for us in, uh, during our childhood. So we were very close-knit and sheltered. Uh, so we never knew much about the public apart from either going to the shop and coming back. And that was life for us and we enjoyed it a lot. Uh, oh, so my did. sisters were my best friends. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so how about for you, uh, Pastor Jaro? How was your growing up? What was what was that like? So, um, mine was totally opposite of, uh, of of Miriam, and so we we, we grew up in, in a I grew up in a big family, <laughs> and so we were eight of us, and uh, and we were like back to back. So there was no like I think the average age difference is like maybe a year and a half. So we were back to back, back to back. Yeah. Uh, and um, eight of us, and then now later we became nine. Uh, but also my dad was also polygamous. So I think in total, my dad has like 21 kids under his belt. And so I think, and we, we, we never used to stay together, but I think that uh, uh, brought a challenge in terms of uh, uh, the parenting, uh, you know, of my dad and mom in terms of giving individualized attention to each of us. I think uh, because we were just too many, so we didn't receive that attention per se uh, from, from my dad and mom. I knew they loved us, uh, but there wasn't like attention, let's sit together, go hug, go talk. As in, you know, with, with eight kids, uh, it, it, it's hard uh, to do that. And so because of that, uh, I, 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 I didn't, I think I kind of struggled with, uh, with attention. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I, I came eventually to connect with my dad after he retired. That's when I think he became my close friend. We'll take it together. But growing up as a young boy, I can't remember any time where, you know, I'll receive that kind of attention or affirmation uh, from my parents. Okay. So, so Miriam here grows in a very neat, uh, kind of neat family, uh, very closely neat. And you grow up, you know, in a family where there's not that much attention. Was there any challenge for you? Um, what did that lack of attention mean? You know, lack of supervision. What, what did that mean for you as probably maybe as a teenager? Yeah, so 
because of that, uh, we became very independent and there was lots of freedom in terms of nobody really cared what you did out there. As long as maybe the report will not come back home because if my dad or my mom get to, uh, got to know, of course there was some serious beating. And so there was lots of freedom, lots of independence, nobody was on your case. Uh, and so I ended up growing up as a teenager, uh, really looking for that love or affirmation or attention in the wrong places. Okay. So I used to be in wrong groups where they would try, you know, some drugs or whatever. Uh, and so uh, it just, I, I was looking for that attention and love, you know, and to be accepted uh, in various groups. So I ended up doing some crazy things as a young person. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so I think okay. I, there's nothing like I can say, okay. I've not tried or done uh, <laughs> okay. as a teenager. My life was just, yeah, lots of drama. Drama. It was quite dramatic. Now, it's so interesting that you would marry yeah. Miriam, who comes from a very, you know, straight family. Miriam, were there any challenges? I mean, it just sounds like it was very perfect. You loved each other. It was close-knit. Uh, were there any challenges that you experienced? Uh, I wouldn't say I experienced any challenge uh, growing up because uh, anyway, I, I was with the people I'm used to. So that was perfectly okay with me. Uh, maybe I would say it's a wish. I wished that my mom would be more open to us, uh, apart from just being strict and tough, you know, uh, it's about school. We had a business. We are either in school or at the shop working and, and you know, just asking us questions. So um, how do you have friends out there or, uh, okay, is have you had it? Have you had your menses? You know, something like that. That's what I would wish. I wish uh, my mom had given us. There. Okay. Yeah, just a lot more yeah. attention, or, or just a lot more affection. Let's just let's just put it that way. So, so maybe I could ask her uh, what. Let's 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 go back to person Jora and just ask. Okay, so you come from this family. So what when you come now and you get married uh, to Miriam? Uh, from your family, from, from what baggage do you think you came into the marriage with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think number one is uh, being eight of us <clears throat> and where there was not individualized attention to each uh, of, of, of my siblings. So the loudest, you know, we knew that the louder you are, the more you heard. So... Uh, all of us are very loud. If you come to a family meeting, you can think like it's a whole studio, but you can only find these three people talking. <laughs> yeah. So I think when it came even now to our conversation, there are moments Miriam will actually catch me and say, Joro, you're actually shouting. But it's because of the way I was cultured in terms of if I raise my voice, then I'm being heard. Oh, wow. Because I'm, I'm the last one of the, of the boys. So I'm like, I need to be heard in this big family. Yeah. And so there are moments where I'll actually shout, thinking yeah. that that's how I'll be heard. The second one is, um, I think, the aspect of being independent uh, and having the freedom. So I never, I was not used to someone asking me, where are you, when are you coming back home? Uh, you know, those, those people normally say, you know, asking nurse questions, you know, like a nurse, you know, those kind of <laughs> questions. So I was never used to it. So yeah, 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 I married this amazing, beautiful uh, young woman, but she wants to know everything. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> why are you asking? You know, all these questions. So I used to tell her, do you want to become a nurse? Because these questions, it's like, you know, they're like those questions nurses or doctors will ask. So I was like, I was very offended and, and I think I, I, I offended her because first she just wanted to know have you been, you know, how is life? I'm like, life is good. If anything wrong, I'm going to call you. So that was another challenge because of my independence and my freedom. I was not used to someone asking me so often. Uh, and the third one, I think it's um, because of the same issue, I was not used to sharing my details in terms of details of my life. Uh, and so she'll come and may I just be like, oh, I'm good. Things are okay. Uh, you know, so I will be very, it's not like it, was, it wasn't my default to, to come and share my heart, my longings, my pains, my emotions, nothing. Me, the only thing is, are you alive? Good. And here's the thing, Pastor Caro, 
you know, in my family, you could actually disappear for two days. Nobody would care to ask you. They know if anything was bad, you could have known by now. So wherever it is, it's okay. So here am I, I am, and every like 30 minutes, Miriam will call, how are you doing? How was the meeting? I'm like, Maza, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so at the, at the, during the, the first years of our marriage, it was really tough. Uh, and for me, I didn't, I was not hearing, like, I was not seeing that from a place of, I care for you, I love you. For me, it was just like, you, you're, you're too much uh, for okay. me. So All those right. are some of the challenges uh, I, I, I had coming from where I was coming from. Okay. Now for you, Miriam, my goodness, I mean, I would feel, you know, as a woman that yes, you know, getting that detail or getting that information is, is really what makes women feel connected. Uh, so how was it when he was not as forthcoming with the information? How did that make you feel? What, yeah, what was that like for you? Uh, the first years, I would really be frustrated like uh you know you have married now your best friend who you're supposed to share everything like for example you've gone to the office uh so you've left kiambu uh south sea is pretty far so have you reached the office he's like yeah then if i call at 10 he's like but why should you call me the whole day like must you always call me if there's anything wrong i will call you so it was really frustrating Looking at, you know, my life with my sisters, like they would call me, if I'm cooking, what are you cooking? If I am shopping, I say, I've gone to shop for a dress. Did you find one? What color was it? Can you take a picture? You know, I want to see. So it was really frustrating for me, not, you know, trying to have the same with my husband. And he's like, by the way, this is just too much. It was just too much. And at some point he was saying, you know, we need to have boundaries. And for me, I was like, uh you know like i'm just sharing how i'm feeling and all that but for him he's he felt like you know i don't have boundaries between us and now my family and uh, that one would drive him crazy as well okay. so it was frustrating and again he just told me your boundaries have to be like i need to have them there and i know this is what i share with my sisters and you know the rest is ours yeah oh, so wow. it was really hard so yeah, i couldn't but... understand well, for me, nobody really cares if you disappear for two days. And Miriam, she's talking with her sisters and actually been sharing that Ata Nikono Avocado Kwanyama. You know, for me, I was like, <laughs> how now? How can you start talking about avocado? Uh, you know, uh, we're we are having avocado or they we are eating rice. And for me, I'm coming from a background where I, I can disappear for two days and nobody really cares. And they, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. So every time I hear her, you know, talking to her sisters, I'll be like, actually, seriously, you're wasting air time, you know? How can you just talk about avocado? You know, my shoes are blue. Details, 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 you know? And I think the biggest challenge was for her, she was, when she was actually asking me, have you reached the office? How is everything? She was coming from a place of, I want to be part of your life. Yeah. Now, for me, on the other side, I'm like, that's not how you become part of my life, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's not how I've been cultured. This is not yeah. how I've been brought up, yeah. you know? But for her, it's like, I'm communicating love. I'm communicating that I, knew, I need to know how you're doing and those kinds of stuff. Yeah. So that's where the clash was coming because yeah. of our different uh, uh, upbringing. Upbringing, yes. And, and it's so true. I mean, the way that love was expressed in your home, Pasanjaro, I... Well, you could go for two, three days, no one cared, but the, somehow there was love. <laughs> it was just expressed differently from Miriam, where the, that um, constant keeping in touch really shows that we care. It's, it's very amazing that when a couple comes into marriage, even the way love and concern is expressed is very different. And it's, your case is just so interesting. I mean, you're totally different totally opposite and it's just very interesting to see how that played out for you guys. Now, in, in some of the videos I've been uh, doing, uh, I was talking about um, uh, different kinds of communicators. I was talking about, there are two basically uh, kinds of communicators in a couple. Uh, we are, there's the one who we are calling the aggressive or the aggressor, you know, the person who communicates openly, you know. And then we have the passive aggressive uh, one, who, you know, is not as expressive and not as open. 
So uh, between the two of you, who is who? Who who is who? Before I make the guess, who is who? Who is the aggressor? Yeah, so I think I'm the aggressive one. <laughs> I'd never have guessed Myself. that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, she, she, she is more of the aggressor. She's very open uh, yes. in terms of addressing issues. Uh, sometimes she can actually be very blunt in terms of even uh, the words. Yeah, <laughs> choice of words. Uh, choice of words. Uh, like, it's like, I'll tell you the way it is. Yeah. Whereas not for me, um, it takes time. By the time I'm, I'm really sharing my deepest, deepest uh, thoughts or pain or emotions. Yeah. So I really take time. Yeah. Uh, but also now when it comes to my, even my attitude, I can just decide to, to keep quiet. Oh, okay. uh, you know, but for her, she's the she, she aggressor. She's aggressor. You know, it's so, no one would ever have imagined that uh, between the two of you. How did you become the aggressor, Miriam? I mean, you, I would have thought it's automatically Passanjoro. In fact, if there was any conflict between the two that you brought to me, I'd tell Passanger, I would first start by warning Passanger on his bad behavior. <laughs> but uh, let me, how, so how, how is it that you, that you're the more aggressive one? Um, I, I, I always say that it, I, I, because of my mom, my mom has been, you know, it was get things done, say what you want. You know, you don't just, go around the bush trying to explain something, but uh, say as it is. And so she rubbed it onto us. And okay. uh, so we ended up, you know, uh, that's the one thing I know. That's the only way you communicate to someone. Just tell them as it is. Okay. Yeah. It's not going around the bush. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the, mom, the mom, oh, the, the mom, the dad was very passive. Passive. He was very passive. Laid back. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. we never okay. had much from him, but my mom, yes. Okay. That, she, okay. I think she's the one who taught us, and so we—that's how we got to learn and nurtured. And this is who we are right now. Oh, okay. So, passenger, how would it be then for you when your wife, you know, came on? You know, how how would you react? How would you respond to that? Wow. I think the first two years, or maybe three, maybe the first two three years. <clears throat> it was really hard uh, for me uh, because uh, I felt attacked uh, because now uh, she'll be very blunt in terms of to, uh, choice of words. She'll be very direct. I think that's the main one. She'll be <laughs> very, direct. very direct. Like, let's not waste time. This is what you did. And so for me, I'll feel ambushed. And I think I used to use that word ambushed until she was like, I hate that word. Because I'd be like, I'm feeling ambushed. <laughs> because I'm not ready for it. I feel like the timing, I feel like I'm being attacked instead of actually raising the problem, you know. And so we, we should, should actually do that. And even for me now, I think there's an aspect where even if I was the passive aggressive one, uh, there is a way I would still turn the story and attack her in a certain way. So you're coming to attack me, I'll also attack you. So we kept on attacking each other, but never, never addressing the problem. Yeah. So it was really hard and hurtful. So eventually I'll hurt her even more uh, because I just felt, look, uh, you can't do this. First of all, the timing is off. The choice of words is off. You know, your attitude or maybe uh, the, the, the approach is totally wrong. And so we'll just keep on attacking and attacking each other. And the first three years was really terrible. It was chaotic, yeah. And so, and so what very, changed? Very uh, for Miriam, what, what changed? How did... How, 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 you know, I'm assuming you're talking about it in terms of the past. So what changed? What enabled you now to begin having sensible conversations and not attacking kind of conversations? Yes, yeah, so we, we sat down because I was not getting the answers that uh, I want from whatever situation or any issue I have raised. So I, you know, through that frustration, I asked him, so how can I, uh, because you're saying I am, uh, you know, like I am so direct, I am attacking you. So how would you want me to, you know, to have this conversation in a way that is safe for you? And so he said, you know what, choose the right words, uh, phrase the way you phrase your, your sentences, please do not come and just attack me. So that was the first thing, uh, learn how to phrase your, you know, your, your sentences, like this is, 
uh, instead of just coming right at him, uh, learn how to phrase the sentences. And the other thing is the timing. So my husband did not want me to just, uh, especially during, uh, you know, in the evening, he didn't want me to bring, you know, those heavy conversations in the evening. Okay. So, and that for me was the best time. So we had to come up also with the best time, which was before he goes to bed, like maybe around seven, that's when we sit down and I can share. So this and this happened. So, um, and then we, uh, from there, I would have a good conversation because I have chosen the right time and the right words. And also we had a way of uh, just tackling the issues and we had an extra seat and we would, the seat would be the problem. And then we talk about the problem, which is on that seat and not the person. So that he doesn't feel like he's being attacked. And also I don't feel like he's not listening to me, but rather we are talking about that issue that is seated there looking at us. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I mean, I love that. And, and I think that was a good coping mechanism where we said, let us not attack each other. Let us attack the issue and you actually even put a visual you you, you put a, yeah. a chair there and you, you actually put the issue there i mean that's just so amazing that that is truly amazing uh so pastor Joro, um I, I, we, you know our time has gone and i want to kind of bring this to a conclusion but i i, I want you to address uh, a couple you know, a couple who find themselves almost in the same situation that you are in, you know, really caught up, embroiled in conflict and really unable to know, you know, they are, they are kind of stuck at this time and they don't know what to do. Uh, and maybe it's the woman who's really frustrated, you know, feeling she's not getting any answers, you know, from her husband and, you know, her husband is just feeling attacked. Uh, what, what practical, you know, advice would you have for them? All right. I think number one is you need to check your posture you know of your heart if your posture is of i need to win in this argument or i need to make sure that my husband feels bad about what he did to be honest every single human being they have their own defensive mechanism on how to get back if they feel threatened and if your spouse either it's a woman uh, right now it's a woman maybe who's trying to get answers from the husband maybe you, the way you've been approaching the issue the man is feeling threatened you know, you, you've been making sure he feels guilty, he feels bad. And for me, that's when I say you, your approach is more like I win, he loses. If that is your approach or maybe is your posture or where you're coming from, your perspective, trust you me, you'll never get any answers. For us, what we said is both of us have to win. That's why we put a third chair. We say the two people sitting on this seat have to win, you know, but none of us is going to lose and say we are all winning you know so both of us have to win so in other words the way you approach uh, the situation is going to come from a place of yes you did this uh, 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 wrong you made a wrong decision but at the end of the day i'm here to support you i still love you i'm still coming from a place of affirmation in as much i'm calling you out so miriam and i we have gone through a lot i've made some really really bad uh, 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 decisions in the past but anytime we address, I have not felt like Miriam is, is bringing out the issue to make me feel bad or to make me feel guilty because at the end of the day, you cannot change the past. The only thing is both of us have a brush to paint our future, but we don't have the power to change our past. So dwelling in the past or trying to make me feel about my past will not bring any good on our marriage at this particular point. The only thing she can do is to help me learn from the mistake. And to say, Joro, you made this bad decision. I felt hard. These are the consequences. This is, uh, the, you know, the, the, the consequences of your bad decision. Man, I pray that you don't do this thing again. So we can only come from a place of what are we learning from our past, not necessarily making me feel bad about, uh, 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 about my past or my bad decisions. So the one thing I'll tell the woman is, check your motive, you know, check your posture. Uh, are you making your husband to feel guilty, to feel bad, to feel like he's the, this evil guy? Or are you coming from a place of, I want to support you, I'm here for you, I love you. And I cannot change what you did, but I can help you not to repeat the same mistake. The second thing is maybe just to look at, uh, don't ambush the guy. Uh, you know, you need to design and even have a conversation. What is the best time? To have a conversation i don't know if he's a morning guy uh, or an evening person or it could be maybe it could be maybe on your sabbath lots of conversations me and miriam will happen on sabbath when you drive 
you know, and just go to Kiambu on the tea plantations. And that's when you'll actually engage in a conversation. So look at the environment also, or maybe the timings. Something needs to change. With this thing of ambushing, I don't think it really works. Okay. You need to agree and say, hey, we need to talk. Can we maybe have Thursday night as a day we can talk? And you're like, okay, I'm going to create that particular time for us to talk. But okay. just ambushing might not actually work. Okay. It doesn't work. Okay. Wow. That is, that's very, that's very helpful because, you know, sometimes uh, the, the situation comes and you want to discuss it there and then, you know, and especially for those who may find themselves, you know, more, the more aggressor type, you want to deal with the situation right there and then. But what I hear you, Pasanjaro, saying is that, no, you know, you may need to think about the timing. You may also need to pause you know, between when the event happens to kind of even just reflect, uh, understand what is it, yeah. what is my motive? You know, what is my motive if in raising this? Is it to build this person up or is it to tear them down? I think that is, that is, that yes. those are very, uh, very, very fantastic insights. Now, um, uh, how about for the guy? You know, the guy, you know, we've talked about the, for the woman, but what would you tell the guy? Because sometimes it gets frustrating. I mean, even for Miriam, she will say, yes, I'm not getting through, you know, <laughs> I'm not getting through. And for a woman, uh, talking and, you know, is, is really one of the ways that women do feel connected to men uh, in their relationship. So what would you tell the man who, you know, like you, was not used to talking? Yeah. So I, I think what I'll tell the guy is that, you know, women are very emotional. I think, first of all, the emotional intimacy is everything to every other woman. You know, everything builds up when it comes to the emotional connection. And emotional connection, it doesn't happen when there are unresolved issues. And so even for you as a guy, you need to understand, anytime there are unresolved issues, it affects everything when it comes to a woman. It affects our, our sexual intimacy, it affects her parenting, it affects everything about her life. And so for you as a guy, the moment you know if there is an unresolved issues, if I were you, is I will be keen and more intentional and be and more proactive to address those issues because I know anywhere there is an unresolved issue for any woman, any woman, regardless of who they are, you know, they're not okay. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're not okay, nothing else will be okay. Yeah. So for any man out there who's listening to me, I think your woman is actually doing you good by bringing issues on the table. Because if they, are, if they remain unresolved, it's you who's going to hurt because nothing else then now is going to be aligned or nothing else is going to, uh, to, to be okay. And so for any man out there, I think our, our, our wives are trying to help us and they're actually coming from a place of love by addressing those issues. Whereas for us, we can actually compartmentalize and unpack issues and still do what we need to do. Our women cannot do that. Everything is so connected. You know, uh, uh, for us, we are more like waffles. You know, the way waffles have all those two little boxes, that's how men we are. We can pack things into small, small boxes. But for Miriam, she's a spaghetti. You know, she's one spaghetti. Everything is connected. And so if for, for the men out there, I'll say, the faster or um, the more uh, the, uh, 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 intentional you are in resolving issues, the better you stand to enjoy your marriage. And so for me, I've been able to trust her that when she brings out the issue, I'm also doing myself good. That the more faster I listen to her and I resolve the issue, there are benefits, yo. <laughs> there are benefits. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. When we go somewhere else, you know, it's Joro who's going to be laughing at the end of the day. Okay. So for me, I'll say, uh, uh, you need to trust your woman. You also need to know how how they, you know, they, 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 they are being created by God. That unresolved issues goes to an unhappy marriage. But yeah. the more you resolve the issues, regardless of how maybe uh, uh, the approach is, and I pray that our women I'm going to learn from today, how to approach the issues and how to raise the questions. But if I was you as a man, is to resolve the issues. And maybe there is a place you feel like, I don't love the way you frame the questions, speak it out. Just tell your wife, hey, I don't love the way you frame the questions. I feel you, you attack me. I feel the timing is wrong. I feel I, I'm ambushed. How, so how can we come up with a framework on how we need to address the issues? Wow. So that's all I'll tell the men. Okay. You need to actually look at the issue from your woman's perspective. Okay. So what I hear you say, thank you so much, is the whole thing of um, even agreeing how to communicate. It's almost like saying, because what you did actually was some ground rules. You said, okay, let us 
don't attack, don't attack, don't attack the, the, the issue, don't attack the person. And you also talked about uh, having a proper time or a proper environment, you know, to have this conversation. So it's, it's like um, uh, having an MOU. This is the way we're going to be communicating. You know, yeah. this is the way we're going to be having our conversations. So that then it's something planned and it's not happening, you know, just <laughs> spontaneously because spontaneous sometimes does not work very well. So thank yeah, you so let me, much. Let me, let me just say something, Pastor Caro. I think even for you to, to be able to be in a place where you're able to, to, uh, to handle or maybe address your issues, on the other side, I feel like many couples don't have tank fillers conversations. They don't have conversations where they are building on each other, they are farming each other. If you're always on the space of addressing issues, then you get tired. And that's why I think many times, uh, you know, some men I've spoken to, they feel like any time I come to a conversation with my wife, there is a high probability she's going to bring about an issue. Yeah. You know, there's something I need to change. There's something I need to do. There's something I need to do differently. But if maybe say, for example, Miriam and I, actually majority of our conversations is to build on each other. We have fun. Our friendship, we can talk about anything and everything. But the time now she comes and tells me we need to talk. I'm not coming feeling hmm, it's another, you know, oh my goodness, it, don't tell me it's another one. So I'm able to say, oh yeah, let's talk because already I feel like I've been affirmed, my tank is full. So what I'll tell even couples is in as much you need to address your issues, I think also you need to up your game in having tank fillers conversations where you're affirming each other, you're dreaming together, you're talking about, you know, the blessing that God has given you. Not necessarily every time there has to be an issue. You're going to drain your partner. So yeah. I think there has to be a balance. And Miriam and I, we have said, our tank fillers conversations yeah. need to be like 60%. And then the 40 is when we're addressing issues. At that time, I will not be scared when I'm coming to these conversations of you need to change something. Um, uh, you know, you wronged me. I feel bad. I'll be like, yeah, let's talk. Because already I'm coming from a place of being affirmed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I feel that we can have this conversation, you know, it can go on and I, I hope that we can, you know, continue with this at some other point. But thank you so much. I'm going to ask you, Pastor Joro, to pray. But before I do that, I do want to extend an invitation. If you're not part of the Mavuno uh, community and you would like to be part of the Mavuno community, if you'd even like you know, to call and have a pastor pray with you or even counsel with you. There's a number there and there's a link there uh, that you can, you know, sign up to and just, just state the place where you're coming from and we will be happy, you know, to pray for you and even to counsel with you. Now, uh, what I've been doing is that uh, I have this little book, it's called The Negativity Fast, and um, I've introduced it before. It's written by this amazing lady. She's called uh, Dr. Geneva. She's a coach. Uh, she's a HR practitioner, and she wrote this book out of her own, you know, uh, feeling that she really did want to get onto a negativity fast. And I have found it very helpful in some of the nuggets that it provides. And, um, and so today, this is day four, and it says today we fast against the thought of it's impossible. It's impossible. And she goes on to say we live in a very skeptical world where doubts fill our day. And and when I think about marriages and relationships, it's very possible that there's somebody listening right now saying it is impossible. We have tried having communication. We have tried, you know, uh, talking and resolving issues and it has been so difficult and you feel that is impossible. One of the things she says here is think about the resurrection day. And she says, if Jesus was raised from the dead, <laughs> then God is able to raise even a dead relationship. Jesus is able to raise even that dead communication. And our hope is that because Jesus is alive and because he's raised from the dead, God is able to raise anything in our marriage that is dead. And so that's, uh, I'd just like for us, you know, to pray that, Pastor Angelo, please pray for anybody who's feeling this is a dead situation, mm -hmm. that maybe today we can trust God that even this week, God will begin to raise those things that are dead for them in their life. So please pray for us. Amen. Our dear Lord, we thank you and we love you because of who you are. We thank you because of your grace. Thank you because you're the Lord who pursues us. 
We thank you, Father, because you chose us even before we chose you. You loved us even before we loved you. And Lord, even uh, tonight, I thank you for every single couple or every single listener. My Father, Lord, tonight, who feels stuck in their relationship or in their marriage, they've been trying to resolve issues, but they feel stuck. And Father, Lord, I just want to pray that, Lord, you're going to intervene in that particular relationship, in that particular marriage, oh God. I want to pray, my Father, Lord, that you may break down walls of pride, break down walls of stubbornness, break down walls, oh my Father, Lord, of, uh, of inferiority or superiority complexes. And God, I just want to pray that, Lord, yeah, you're, there's going to be humility. My Father, Lord, there's going to be brokenness. People will be able, my Father, Lord, to have a clear understanding and clarity, oh Father, Lord, that the moment, oh Lord, you brought them together is because you're going to use them, my Father, Lord, even to, to, make, more, to, to make them more, to be more like Christ, oh Father. They're going to sharpen each other. They're going to call out each other so that they can become men or women that you desire them to be. And so, Father, right now, where there is, you know, it's more like a dead bone situation in that particular relationship and marriage, I speak life in Jesus' name. Where they feel they have reached a dead end, Lord, I pray for a new beginning as they listen to us, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. And God, oh my Father, Lord, I pray when they come together, Lord, I ask, oh my Father, that your power will demolish every single demonic stronghold. There is, uh, the, 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 your power is going to demolish lies and deceptions of the day of the enemy over those particular marriages. And Father, we pray for life in Jesus' name. We pray for understanding. We pray for peace. We pray for the ability to forgive each other. We pray for ability to move on from the past. They cannot change their past, oh Lord. But my Father, Lord, they can build a better future together. And so, Lord, I pray they shall not hold on to grudges, oh God. They shall be able to be humble, to ask each other questions and to respond to each other in a respectful way. So, Father, we bless them and we pray for testimonies tonight, oh Father, that, Lord, as they listen to us, Lord, something is going to shift in their marriages, in their communication. So we speak, we speak the resurrection power of God to come upon you in the name of Jesus. That right now, even as you maybe take up your phone or even text or call your spouse and say, you're gonna, we, we need to talk. The Holy Spirit will go ahead of you. Our God is going to go ahead of you. And God is going to, be, to give you victory. So we thank you and we give you praise, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, prayer. Uh, I would say, let us trust God. Let us trust God. Let us invite God into our marriages and let us trust him uh, to resurrect anything that is dead. Could it be love? Could it be hope, uh, faith? Let us trust him uh, to resurrect that. So thank you so much, Pastor. And that's all that we have time for. Uh, until next time, we are rooting for you and we look forward to just spending more time with you. So thanks and God bless.